Hi, my name is Marilyn Murray. I'm an honor student with Northeast State Community College. Today, we're gonna to be interviewing Linda Calvert. Linda, could you please introduce yourself to everyone, please? Sure, thank you, Marilyn, uh, for the opportunity to participate uh, in these sessions. Uh, my name is Linda Calvert, and I am an employee of Northeast State Community College. My current position is Vice President for Administration and Grant Development. Uh, prior to that, in the 30 plus years that I have been uh, employed uh, by the college, I've held roles from de assistant dean, dean, assistant vice president, executive director, and so on. Uh, prior to coming to Northeast State, I was employed by Pellissippi State Community College in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I was department uh, head for the mathematics and science division. And I also was uh, classified as an associate professor of mathematics because I taught classes uh, while I held that role. Um, I guess that's, is that all you want to know about my, just my initial, my professional history or anything else? Well, that's extremely impressive, Linda, uh, Ms. Calvert. It's very, very, very impressive. Um, I like that. Would you mind if I ask you a few questions? Sure. Okay, wonderful. Um, in the past, you've spoken about the challenges of leaving your family and community in Mississippi when you relocated here to Tennessee in 1989. In a featured story for the Tennessee News, you said, our parents were very involved in the community, and I think they were possibly growing up we did not have face-to-face -face confrontations with the issues of the time with segregation. Could you talk in more detail about what you mean and what did you see and what did you think or did not see here? Okay, in response to your question, uh, let me just say that I relocated to Tennessee in 1977. Um, oh. I moved to the Tri-Cities area in 1989. Uh, and uh, as a child growing up, uh, in the state of Mississippi. Most people say there are some states they never want to visit or travel through, and Mississippi is one of those. But as a child growing up in the 60s, in the segregated South, um, segregation uh, was a standard rule for the day. And uh, even though there were uh, signs on restrooms and water fountains that dictated who should and should not use them, um, my, the reference there is, my parents chose not to access those colored only uh, facilities. So there was never any going around to the back of a restaurant to get a meal or anything like that. Uh, I'm not even aware if my parents knew anything about, now they talk about the green book and the green book is that uh, publication that includes uh, references to uh, those establishments that were friendly to people of color who were traveling around the United States. But I can recall in uh, traveling from Mississippi to my mother's home in Georgia, uh, we always managed to, that was one of the, the uh, uh, highlights of the trip. We always managed to eat at these nice black owned restaurants in either Alabama around Montgomery or Phoenix City or going into Columbus, Georgia, right across the river from Phoenix City, right across the border, I should say. And um, so we always had that advantage. So, and in that, re in that respect, never having to experience those, or those things that were labeled as white only or colored only. And I can say that we had a very rich, uh, had a very rich childhood with family vacations, even though we stayed with relatives, again, occupying um, hotels at the time was, was, a, was a luxury and they weren't even uh, friendly to people of color. But during that time, even with all of those restrictions, uh, before I was 13 years old, I'd been to the White House, Niagara Falls and the Grand Canyon. So um, growing up was, uh, there was a challenge during the, uh, during the 60s, but uh, my, my parents um, made sure that we had a very rich uh, environment to grow up in and that we had all of the, the benefits that, that life could provide at that time. Right. Um, you mentioned about um, your parents and the signage about whites only. Did they ever communicate with you about how they felt about that when they saw these signs? 
I, I think that the mere fact that um, there was a silent communication in a sense that uh, that was something that we did not stoop to, we did not have to, because during the time it was very obvious that those places that had colored only signs were not cleaned, they were not well kept, and it was, you know, you probably would be using it at your own peril. So that part of it was, was kind of understood. Um, my parents also did not, um, in shopping, there were several of the stores in my town that actually allowed uh, people of color to come into the store and to try on clothing. Because even during the 60s, the 50s and the 60s, you'd almost have to know what's the size you wore. or You couldn't try on anything because if you did, many store owners say they couldn't resell that. So that was also, that was also an issue. But, but I, I understood as I got older, uh, particularly around the seventh grade, um, my brother and I became, uh, well, joined a group of other students who left the majority black uh, school system and went to um, the majority white schools under a program of freedom of choice. And um, it was during that time that we, I realized that there were people who didn't want to be around me. And my parents saw it as an opportunity for us to, uh, to uh, be exposed to additional learning opportunities. And it was also during that time that I learned the importance of excelling. The fact that because of what I looked like, I had to do much, much better than everyone else in my class just to be considered average. And in many ways that continues even to now. Thank, thank you for that, Linda. And I kind of asked that extra question there, um, but that had me really intrigued. Um, it also says that you worked to secure an $11.9 million Hope Six uh, Revitalization Grant from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, mm -hmm. which is part in part helped redevelop the Riverview neighborhood. Why was this project so important to you, and how did you complement some of the community buildings, orga organizing, and the outreach work? Okay, thanks, Meryl. That's a very good question. Uh, Hope Six was is was very important uh, to the uh, Kingsport area. Uh, I've served as a member of the uh, Kingsport Housing and Redevelopment Authority for over 15 years. And uh, the mission of the authority is to transform, to empower the Kingsport community with social, economically diverse and empowered housing communities. So having the HOPE 6 project, which really HOPE 6, HOPE stands for housing opportunities for people everywhere. And in that particular, that particular funding uh, cycle, there were only four projects funded throughout the United States and Kingsport, Tennessee was one of those. So why did we pursue that project? Well, it was, the project was designed to replace the public housing units that were in the Riverview community. And the public housing units in the Riverview community were among the oldest and those in much need of repair that were owned by um, KHRA, Kingsport Housing. In addition to the um, barrack style housing that was in place, which was state of the art when it was first built, but you know, when you look at something that was built in the 40s or the 50s and you look at the how things have changed. Uh, the area around the housing uh, uh, projects had also become a gathering place for criminal and drug related activity. So um, with another project I was involved with that was called Weed and Seed, it was a Department of Justice uh, program. We worked with members of that community and the police in a community policing project to eliminate the drug-related activity in that area. 
And as a result of that elimination um, and making that area one of the safest places in Kingsport to live, the revitalization through Hope 6 created what was then a safe environment for both children as well as the elderly. And Riverview was, is more than just a, was more than just a public housing. There were uh, residential housing around the perimeter, but it also helped to elevate the property values of those uh, of those houses. The new houses that were built uh, in any other neighborhood, uh, if you took those houses and placed them in any other neighborhood, you're talking about houses with a value anywhere from 175 thousand dollars upward and uh, they, they're used as transitional housing to provide uh, that opportunity for the residents to learn how to become real home owners so it's not a permanent home but it is transitional and so that's that's one of the reasons why it was very very important and we have seen some success uh, from uh, from that project very good project for the city I guess some of the, um, what you would say, the uh, collateral results from that was the revising or the, the remodeling of the, um, what was the uh, community center, the old Douglas school that was there. And now it's called the, the V. O. Dobbin Senior Complex. Mm -hmm. And it does house the uh, United Way and several other agencies. So it has become a, um, a bright spot in the community and in uh, combined with the uh, housing, it showed a commitment from the city as well as other business and industries and making that uh, commitment and the investment in that area. That's just absolutely amazing. <laughs> I can listen to you talk about this all day. I love it, this, it's <laughs> wonderful. So you not only impacted your community and giving better housing, you also helped uh, to you know clean up uh, some of the drug activity, you you just, you absolutely empowered your whole community. That's just Working with, uh, there was, there's some great people in the neighborhoods, not only in the Riverview area, but in the surrounding uh, residential areas and, and uh, also across what they call the highway area. That's that's how it's referred to. But uh, in the residents around and what we call, we, we, we label it the South Central Kingsport area. And it's defined with, um, the census tract groups and so on. Um, but by bringing all of those interested parties to the table and working with uh, city leadership, you, we could see a change. There's been a cha change in that community. Well, I, I just think that's absolutely amazing. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna move on to our next question. Um, here at Northeast State Community College, you are the chief diversity officer. While this, question may seem self-evident. Can you explain why diversity and all shapes and forms matter? Well, diversity matters because when uh, business and industry, colleges and universities and communities recognize and build on all of our uniqueness, huh? then we as a people, whether it's a business, an industry, a university, a Northeast state, we're able to operate at our optimum capacity because we all bring something to the table. And when you're able to, uh, to capitalize on that, then it's not just about defining someone based on their race, which we know is a social construct, uh, their ethnicity, their gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomics, age, physical abilities, our religion, our political beliefs, and any other ideologies that we might have, because those are the things that we allow to separate us. But I believe that we have more in common than we have in our differences. So in my role, uh, goes, it, just, it goes beyond just the typical definition of diversity. My role includes a focus on um, access, a focus on inclusion, and more important than diversity is the equity. Because it's not enough just to be, and this is the example that's given, 
it's not enough just to be invited to watch the baseball game. I don't know about everybody else, but I'm only 5'1". So if the fence is eight feet tall, being able to come to the game and watching through the fence, that's a different thing because I can't see. Now, true, someone could probably say you can cut out a little hole and I can look through that or put some steps up there so I can actually see. But it would be even better just to remove the fence and let us all come in. And so that, that's why I think the role of, uh, of having a, a diversity officer now in this time is important. Long term, if diversity officers and the people with whom they work do the job that's necessary to celebrate differences and to bring all people to the table, then there won't be a need for a diversity officer. But right now, my responsibility is to keep the, the subject at the forefront for this institution. And just as other, uh, other businesses and industries, everyone's now rushing to hire a chief diversity officer or someone who works in diversity. Overall, our responsibility is to be the conscience for the organization to ensure that we're not forgetting about the richness that comes with each individual, regardless of the differences that we might be able to see. But I celebrate those differences that we can't see. If you think about the iceberg, there's only so much you can see above, but what actually allows that iceberg to stay afloat is what you don't see. And that's what we never get a chance to do. We don't allow ourselves to see what's below the water level. Well, I know Northeast State is, um, and I'm a part of Northeast State. We are so privileged and happy to have you. Well, thank and you. Um, with your collaborative efforts and in creating space for diversity and, and celebrating um, everyone in a collaborative way, I think it's just, it's amazing. Thank you for what you do there. We really appreciate that. Um, on the next question, can you describe what it means, and we've kind of already talked about this, to be the Northeast State Community College's, uh, let's see, Chief Diversity Officer, and can you identify some of your successes? We'll start there. Okay, so again, as the Chief Diversity Officer here at Northeast State, I'm responsible for identifying any barriers that might hinder a student from being successful um, and working with appropriate senior administrators because this is not something, it's not a one person uh, responsibility. We all have to get involved with this because a, a diverse environment, uh, a diverse campus is gonna help our students learn to communicate helps our students learn how to work with others. And uh, we have to be able to work with others with, from different backgrounds when we go into the workplace. So this is, this, is, this is our training ground right here. So we can provide those opportunities here and, and, and hopefully identify some of those hangups that we might have, address those in such a way that when our students go out into the work force, they are well prepared to work with others who are not like them. So that's that's one of that's one of the things. That's why I think it's important that we have the, op the diversity officer here on our campus. Your second question was uh, any notable failures or initiatives that we've had. Well, I think it's too early for us. You know, we haven't been in at this long enough to, to talk about failures. Every, every step that we make is a positive <laughs> step. So let me just let me just highlight a couple of things. Uh, the um, in the fall, we were fortunate enough to be able to hire a, a coordinator of inclusive excellence and our coordinator and inclusive excellence is the term that was coined by the um, I think it's American Association of Colleges and Universities. And it's it's like an umbrella term that in, encapsulates uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The, um, our coordinator of inclusive excellence is um, Tanga Maadwa, uh, who came to us from um, 
Appalachian State University uh, with some uh, previous experience at University of North Carolina, Asheville, and Columbus State uh, Community College in Ohio. And uh, he's been at work uh, this semester, uh, working very diligently. Number one, he's launched a newsletter for inclusive excellence that comes out every other month. And he's working uh, with the establishment of a multicultural center. The multicultural center idea was incorporated in a Title III grant that the college uh, had funded um, for a five year period. Just a small amount of money was there, but we were also fortunate to be able to access our uh, diversity dollars from the Tennessee Board of Regents. So we are establishing a multicultural center uh, in uh, A208 uh, here on campus. And we're looking forward to that being open uh, probably midsummer. We'll do a soft opening at that time. So we're right now we're going through a process with a consultant um, who's worked at Vanderbilt to uh, brand that space, looking at the types of programming that we will have. And that, that process has involved some listening sessions with several different groups uh, here on campus. So we're very excited about that. The uh, other um, achievement that we've had is that we have uh, been able to offer several workshops. Actually, it was a series of workshops on inclusive excellence with an inclusive excellence consultant from Appalachian State uh, University. Dr. Brandy Bryson has been working with us. So that's been great for our faculty uh, to have those experiences and to work, work with her. And then finally, what I'm most proud of is the college's decision to incorporate uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the overall strategic plan. So we're going through that strategic planning process right now. And um, our strategic plan will have equity, uh, inclusion, and diversity goals embedded in the document across all aspects, the, the uh, community um, education components, our transfer and academic section, sessions, as well as the uh, facilities. So rather than having a, a, a separate uh, strategic plan for uh, diversity, all of our goals are going to be incorporated throughout. Because one thing is, is true, if you don't have a means or process for measuring, it won't get done. So by including equity, diver diversity, and inclusion in our strategic plan, we have a mechanism for ensuring that it will be done. Because I, you know, I, I've been at Northeast State for a while. I would hate to leave the institution to retire and um, find out a year later that everything ceased to exist because it all surround, was built on a single individual. That's why we have to spread all of this out throughout the institution to achieve buy-in. And once we get buy-in from the top down, then we'll be assured that there will be a, a good uh, diversity program, inclusive excellence here at the college for years to come. I, I think that's just amazing. And I'm super excited about it. Um, I'm graduating in May, but I'm gonna take a couple <laughs> extra classes at Northeast. Uh, just to compliment my degree. And so I'm definitely going to be checking that out. Um, I just okay. think that's amazing. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> All right. In 2016, you coordinated the Educate for Success conference. And in the interview to promote the conference, you spoke about the desire to be in, um, intentional about involving students in the educational process. What does it mean to you to involve students in the educational process? And why is this necessary steps in ensuring student success? Wow, you all went really went back, huh? Did you just <laughs> dug up all these quotes? Uh, I was a part of the team that put together the Ed Educate for Success uh, conference <laughs> uh, back in 2016. And, and our focus on involving students in the educational process I can use an example that we're that we're uh, relying on right now. As we get ready to launch the um, uh, multicultural center, we're looking at that as being a student-led uh, function of the college. Uh, when students have uh, buy-in, again, I like to use that word. When they have a seat at the table, then 
that's just a way of ensuring that they we know what they need and then we can respond to those needs. So that's why I think it's important to have students involved in the overall educational process. And, and Northeast State provides that uh, for our students. We have uh, leadership uh, opportunities through clubs and we have uh, a mentoring program. So I'm very pleased with what we're doing, but uh, we always have to ensure that we, that we find out what, what the student is thinking so that we can meet their needs. I think that's wonderful. You know, as a student, um, I was asked questions about what my needs were and I ended up getting in the mentor program to help other students. Right, um, right. And it, yeah, it, it's been wonderful. And the, you spoke about the clubs because I remember the Five Theta Kappas too, which is the Honor yes. Society. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an excellent club that helps promote those students and they really do celebrate diversity and inclusiveness in this club, um, you know, just to help one another. So what you've been doing is amazing because I can see that in uh, a lot, lot, anywhere I look in the college, I can see that. Uh, yeah, so that's Phi really Theta Kappa, I was, uh, Phi Theta Kappa was actually started when I was a Dean of Liberal Arts. So I uh, was responsible for the sponsorship of that, the initial uh, sponsorship of that. And then thanks to the great work that you all have done in working with Dr. Honeycutt, um, Phi Theta Kappa International recognized me under one of those categories a few years ago. So I applaud the work that's being done there and uh, applaud you for stepping out to being a mentor because that's a great, not only a great learning experience, it's also a leadership, leadership development. It, it really is. And all those programs, I think, for um, any students watching this is excellent to get involved in because it's not only going to teach you the inclusion and um, diversity, it's going to give you those leadership skills, just like you talked about, um, and put you in a unique opportunity to do different research for the school. And I, I loved it. I loved every minute of doing those programs. And, um, I, like and the fact too, I like the fact, too, that you all have, have, have tackled some very challenging uh subject matter. You don't just, you know, walk that little narrow line, but you've really stretched your wings, so to speak, and, and done some, um, some work out in, in the community and working with the, uh, the alternative school and then your research uh, project that you're working on this year. I think everything's, it's a great opportunity and I encourage all students to think about that. Yeah, it's it's been wonderful. I've yes. really enjoyed it. Um, okay, back to you though. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we're gonna. I want to transition into talking about bigger national stories right now, and um, this one's been on everyone's mind, I think. And when you re reflect on the protests during the summer of 2020 in response to the murder of George Floyd, what thoughts do you have, especially as a person? who has worked so long to increase diversity in our, in our country? Well, when I think about uh, the current climate, um, I see this more so as a perfect storm in a sense, because we um, faced with COVID-19, then we started to experience the economic downturn when everyone was sent home. Uh, you know, the college continued to operate with, the, I'd say a skeleton crew, what we call essential workers. I'd like to think of them as people who are doing essential jobs. Um, and then we hit the spring and the summer with the George Floyd uh, incident. I have to say that when you go back and look historically at events that have happened over the last 10 years or so that may have involved uh, police. The, the difference for many with the George Floyd incident and several of those others is that we saw it right there in living color. It was not a delayed uh, uh, message that may have shown up in the newspaper on the radio we were all at home so in the where people may not have seen been watching the news or whatever because we were at home we saw what was going on so and and in a, in a response to that 
I really don't know why people are so, uh, what is it, man's inhumanity to man. Don't really know the rationale behind why. And if I did, I probably wouldn't be sitting here with you now and be out selling it to someone else. But my thoughts about um, how does this impact uh, diversity? One of the outgrowths of the George Floyd incident was the um, business and industry response. Everyone felt uh, for the first time that in many ways enough was enough. It was time to take a stand and say that we do not condone these types of, of activities. And, you know, there's always um, uh, some will say, well, he had broke the law. So he should have been, you know, because he had broken the law, police officers had a right to do what they had, what they did to, to uh, restrain him. But the level of restraint could, did not have to be to the extent that it was. I am not, I would not classify myself as uh, anti-law enforcement or anti-police. Uh, my husband served with the Kingsport Police Department as a reserve police officer for a number of years. Therefore, I know that they each time an officer goes out, and that included my husband as a reserve officer, the prayer is that that person will return home safely. So it is possible to be in those situations and you get that adrenaline rush and you know, everything that, that happens, um, happens with that. So your question is, what thoughts do I have? I, I really think that it's time for our country to come together and to realize if we, if we look at, like I said, what we have in common versus what we have that would, would some would say would make us different, that we can solve these problems, but you have to have the want to. That's my word. You have to want to do something about the problem versus to perpetuate uh, the problem. So in many instances, in many, as I looked at the summer of 2020, it reminded me a lot of some of the summers of the 60s. And, the, you know, the only difference uh, then and now is that we saw it on the at the six o'clock news because we didn't have 24 hour news stations uh, this summer. It was on continuously. But many of the concerns, many of the issues that were present in the 60s, those same issues are present now. And you would like to think that in a, a 60 year span of time that we as intelligent people in one of the most, uh, I guess, productive countries in the world would find a way to address these issues before it gets overblown and we're having to have uh, more killings and burning of buildings and cars being turned over and uh, all of those, the social unrest that goes along with, with this situation. It, 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 it disturbs me uh, a lot that in my lifetime, instead of that part of life getting better, it's still, it either has stayed the same or in some instances has gotten worse. I'm going to um, piggyback on what you just said about um, trying to find a way as intelligent as we are and to try to work together. Um, I watched a video on something called unbiased consciousness, where you do things or you may react to a situation before you realize um, where this thought's coming from. Mm -hmm. And it can be like an old belief in yourself. And it was talking about getting uncomfortable and kind of really going through why do you react to people the way that you react. And I think that's, you know, 
goes very much with what you were talking about, about knowing who you are and trying to work through it as intelligent as we are. And, you know, just kind of opening up maybe and having those uncomfortable conversations that people may not want to have because of the subject matter. But I think that would maybe be a first step also. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? We have to educate ourselves. I've been reading a book, uh, it's CAST, and it's talking about the CAST system um, worldwide. It's not just in the um, in the United States. And I think in the United States, we have more of an un, unwritten caste system, but there are caste systems throughout. And we, for whatever reason, we have uh, groups of people who think that there has to be someone uh, at the top of the heap and someone who has to be at the bottom. And we do whatever we can to make sure that we hold those positions. And the way that has been established, and, and I have not, you know, I like to go back, I have not uh, done any triangulation of what uh, the author has written, but um, she indicates that this goes back even to uh, uh, slavery, based on slavery that, you know, individuals coming over from uh, European countries they were not at the top of their game or where they lived. So when they came to the United States, they were coming for a better life. But at the same time, they had seen this modeled in their countries and they all, and, the, and as a result, want to be, maintain that top rung on the ladder and will do everything possible to keep everybody else in line. And therefore, this, the caste system in a way plays into a lot of what we see with the way uh, individuals are treated, that man, man's inhumanity to man. Well, thank you for adding that. I know it was kind of an extra question there, <laughs> um, but um, that was that was a very good point that you made. And I just wanted to add to it. Um, mm -hmm. You spent so much of your time in your career helping to build and foster communities. So what do you think this pandemic um, should teach us about the importance of communities, especially the African American communities, which studies suggest that pandemic has hit them the hardest. Mm -hmm. Is it any rethinking we might need to do on our part or maybe change our ways? Well, and when you look at the impact the pandemic has had um, on uh, various communities, you can look at it from um, an occupational level um, in with the from the perspective that many of those who have been um, impacted in the African-American community work in those, uh, they, they're performing essential jobs. And those essential jobs are such that they're either low pay, not having access to um, health insurance or doctor's care. And if they live in a large city, they were traveling on uh, using public transportation. Um, I heard of uh, someone on the newscast the other day who says, you know, I haven't, I haven't owned a car in six years. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, in a city you can get by without owning a car because you're either doing uh, public transportation or you're hailing a cab. So we look at that, those, their um, occupations. Then we look at um, the overall, I guess the health care situation, which we've had in the news and all of those debates and we look at all the negative components of that and, and how the African-American community may have been uh, impacted the most. But what I have been overjoyed by is seeing how members of the community, those physicians who have taken their clinics and turned their, uh, their medical clinics into testing areas for uh, people in their neighborhoods um, those that have actually um, made their clinics uh, vaccination sites, you know, and I look at the professionals who the nurses and the doctors of African American descent who are in the hospitals and they were there uh, day after day and, um, you know, working with those who were hospitalized, some of them even um, having to, uh, they succumb to the illness. So that, 
you know, you've got the pluses and you got the minuses. We hear a lot more about the negatives and, um, but there have been some positives that have come out of this because communities have looked at ways that how can we help each other during this, during this, 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 what I call the perfect storm. Because everyone in a sense went indoors, but yet while they were indoors, they were still able to reach out to their neighbors to make sure that they were doing well. So it, it has for many, and I've talked to several people who say it's brought back a sense of community, which was not there uh, before. But it is my desire that everyone who is able to um, take the vaccination will do so. Uh, we know that there are questions about it and the questions about should the vaccination, should, should we take the vaccination seems to be resonating more with the 20s and 30 somethings who are suddenly now questioning the science. Has it been around long enough? Did they test it sufficiently? Um, but we're going to have to, re you know, when you look at the number of deaths and you look at just this, um, only 50% of the population has taken even one dose of the vaccine. This is what we've been, this is what we were waiting for this time last year, trying to get, a, you know, some way, some relief. And at the same time, um, as we go through this, uh, I don't, I think there's still lessons that we can learn from the pandemic. I like the, the thought that has been out there that everyone should just, you know, take some time and write down how has this impacted you? What did you learn from it? And what are the lessons that you would want to share with someone else? Because if we really did that, it's just like so many other things, I think we could probably, um, we could probably lessen the impact of discussions on the negatives and concentrate on the positives. That's wonderful. Um, that is all the questions I had for you today. Um, the, th those were amazing and I absolutely love this conversation. And I know I learned a lot from you and I really, really appreciate you, Ms. Calvert. Um, I, I really do. Well, thank you for the opportunity and look forward to uh, seeing this when it comes out. And um, if there's anything else that I might be able to do for you all as you go through this process, don't hesitate to let me know. We really appreciate your time and your efforts in uh, in helping us with this project, and you're very appreciative. We're very appreciative of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And everything you do. Bye. Right. <laughs> bye. 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 -bye.